Hi, everyone, and welcome to my very first interview. I'm not going to make him wait too long. He's uh, in the studio. I'm very happy to introduce to everyone. Well, not introduce because everybody knows him already. So there you go, John Mashita Jr. Hey, how are you all doing today? It's really pleasure to be here. I can't believe this is your first interview. I thought this, I didn't know this was your first interview. I knew you did lots of videos and things like that. And I saw the one video and I thought you did a really good job. And that's why I wanted to talk to you. But I thought you've been talking to people for all this time. <laughs> <laughs> sorry <laughs> that's yeah it is my first interview i've i've never done this before um so this is i've done live stream before i've connected with a lot of people that um you know from uh, the youtube channels uh that the people that have inspired me to start doing youtube and everything so i've connected with these people i've been interviewed uh with that uh, throughout the uh, the community uh, about uh, three times now but uh yeah no this is my my first and Hopefully this will open up something, you know, like well, I, I, hope, I hope so. Love. You did a, you did a great job on the video you did. Um, so many people uh, screw things up. So you you got it almost ninety nine point nine percent correct, which is way above the average person. So this, I'm happy to help you out with this. It's it's you you gave when you wrote that on my video. You gave me first. You, you're the first actor to comment on this video, so that was that blew me away. And then after that. The fact that you commented that I, my research paid off, really, like I went through written interviews and TFCon uh, panels and uh, Wikipedia and uh, IMDb. And, you know, I tried to puzzle everything together. And uh, I, when you said that I had it right, that it, it justified everything I've been doing for a year and a half. It did. Well, so good, I'm, good. I'm extremely happy to have you here. Uh, people uh, are uh, I'm just going to go through the chat quickly as uh, customary. Uh, so we have, well, I'm going to put her first. That's my girlfriend. So she hates <laughs> attention. So, but, uh, there you go, honey, Adam, great to see him. He's been a long time follower. Oh, that's my sister. She's watching at home actually with my mom and dad. Ah, uh, yeah. Hi mom and dad. <laughs> <laughs> and who else? Ninja Bill, my partner for the wheel of time review. Thank you. Lone dragon. And I'm just going to go down a little bit. Robot recruits. Thank you. The void. Oh, that's a new name, Kaylee O'Connell. Never seen you before. Thanks for coming. Uh, who do we have else? Uh, I think that's pretty much. No. Hey, Kaylee. I know Kaylee. Kaylee's nice. You know Kaylee. Kaylee's great. Yes. Good All to right. see you, Kaylee. There you go. So we have, uh, there's a lot of people coming in right now. Uh, Thomas Nguyen. Oh, this is. This, Rodimus Primal, this is the guy that got me started this whole thing. This is the guy who opened up telling me it's okay to be a 44-year-old guy who wants to collect plastic robots. Go ahead and do it. <laughs> so it's all. And another guy, Cato, he's the reason I started YouTube because he said, I said, I'm thinking about it. And he said, just do it and I'll watch it. So I hold these two a lot. So thanks for being here. And then I saw, that's my friend, Mig. Thanks, Mig. And this is Memo, another of my partner, um, who's going to be moderating the chat today, make sure there's no, you know, troll and everything. So, so yes, yeah, so I think I, I'm sorry if I missed anyone. Oh, David. There you go, David. All right. So, um, I'm, this is, more, you know, an interview, but also mostly just a discussion. You know, I don't want it to be too formal because uh, I, I know you've done quite a lot of those uh, interviews and everything. So, um, but yeah, just, just a couple over the last 40 years. <laughs> yeah. So it's been a, a, a long career. Like you've never stopped working. No, I've been very, very lucky. I really can't complain. I, um, I've been working well, really since the seventies in New York, I was, you know, involved in the business in one shape or another doing plays or working in production and then getting in front of the camera and doing whatever. And, Really, as far as like the fast talking stuff, that kind of caught on in the early 80s. And that's just kind of propelled me for over 40 years now. That's a that. And it it's a I know people have claimed to have been able to beat your record, but I think there's been cheating involved. Uh, well, I, I don't I, I don't think they're cheating. I think it's a very you know, they, a lot. I, they don't even put it in the book a lot of the years anymore. And I think the reason they don't do that is because it's a very subjective record, you know, can you really understand what the person's saying? You know, my my feeling is if you take something that I do and some of the other people and put them side to side and listen to them, I'm the only one you can understand. But well, that's a you thing. know, 
it's, you know, uh, but that's but it's subjective. So if they decide at the Guinness Book that someone did 600 words a minute instead of 584, that's their decision. I have no control over that. But uh, the reality is for the stuff that I do for TV and whatever, I'm not talking nearly as fast as the world record speed. And, uh, you know, I'm doing other characters and people can understand what I'm saying. So there's a lot more to it than just trying to get in the Guinness Book. Exactly. So no, but I think you're right on that. The the, the key factor is being understood. That's the because I mean I know some kids who talk really fast, but you can't understand anything. So yeah. All right. So can you? I'm just gonna go with the question that I have, and I do have a couple. Sorry, anybody in the chat that I might. Uh, I I'm probably not gonna look at the chat that much right now, but uh, at the end, uh, if I we have time, I'll uh, I'll I'll check for uh, some questions from you guys. Um. Just can you give us a quick resume for those who haven't seen my spotlight? A uh, quick resume of your journey into becoming an actor. Well, I always wanted to be an actor from the time I was a kid growing up on Long Island. I did a lot of community theater. I did all the plays in school. I majored in theater in college. Uh, I moved into Manhattan. I did some off-Broadway stuff. I was working television production. Uh, that led to a job in Ohio working for a Warner Brothers on their first, uh, it was called Cube. It was the world's first two-way interactive television system. Yeah. And we went on the air in Columbus, Ohio on December, 3rd, on December 1st, 1977, with 11 hours of live programming a day. And I was responsible for producing some of those shows, hosting some of those shows. Uh, and then in addition, Nickelodeon was just starting. And I had my own, I was one of the first shows on Nickelodeon. It was called Nickel Flicks. And I was on a question from a fan. Um, ah. uh, Lone Dragon, here, here's your question already. Uh, he wanted me to ask uh, about the show that you produced, uh, Nickel Flicks. And uh, he wants to know if there's anything that you can tell us about uh, your experience. Because... There's not a lot about that show online. There's not enough, uh, you know, not much footage and everything. So you want yes, to unfortunately, I had every episode that we did on tape. And when I moved to California, I put everything in storage. And through no fault of my own, it was a mix up with the post office and whatever else. All my stuff got sold at public auction. So I lost all those videos. Uh. And there's very little film of that that exists. That's uh, terrible. When Nickelodeon started, it was supposed to be the nonviolent kids network, you know, and it was all going to be fun, enjoyable stuff for kids. Okay. Well, what Nickelflix was, was uh, I played like a Sydney Green Street kind of character in a white suit and a Panama hat and a big rattan chair. And we showed the old serials from movies, you know, like the Flash Gordons and those kind oh, of things. Okay. And then I would comment on them, make, you know, silly little comments about it. The problem was those things are very violent. So after a while, even though a lot of people were watching the show and I thought I was very funny on it, Nickelodeon finally came up with other shows to put on the air and they didn't have to keep that on. And they had gotten complaints that they were supposed to be the nonviolent network. And here is this show where everyone's getting shot and cars are going off of cliffs and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So it got canceled. So it was one it was one of the first shows on the air and the first show canceled. OK, so that's, uh, I guess, a record for the station that. Uh... But yeah, you was really interesting. Like when I did research on on you, um, I did went and take a look at what Cube was and everything. So it was really, um, you know, groundbreaking technology at the time, and it paved the way for so many like pay per views and uh, you know other interactive shows. It really, that's the basis. So yeah, no, it was the it was the first first two way interactive uh, cable system in the world, and literally people came from around the world to look at it and to watch it and the computer that it took to run the system which now you could run on your telephone took two warehouses it was two big giant warehouses wow. and That's... you could ask i could ask a question like i could say you know what's your favorite color and then give you choices and everybody could vote and then i could tell you 49 percent said red 32 percent said green or whatever or i could specifically ask you what your color was and you could tell me what your answer was so uh, you could either poll one person or just kind of get the whole feel for the audience. And some of the shows are really fun. We had like a, a gong show. It was called Star Search. And people would come on and they'd do an act. And if the people at home didn't like it, they touched the no button. And if more than 50% of the people didn't like the act for longer than 10 seconds, the act got gonged and had to okay, stop. So that's, that's, that's kind of cool that you get the, the public's reaction right away. 
Exactly. And then we had a lot of talk shows where, the, you know, they could ask people opinions on various different subjects and whatever. And there were kids shows and there was Flippo's Magic Circus uh, where kids could participate and play the games with either the red team or the blue team. So it was fun. It was an excellent uh, education. I was there for t almost two years. And then after that, it was, you know, enough. It was time to go. And that's when I moved out to California. Yeah, exactly. And then after that, you got your groundbreaking episode of uh, what's it called? That's incredible. That's incredible. I happened to be at a party one night and a friend of mine who's from New York and talks very quickly was trying to pick up a Valley girl. And she looked at him and said like, Oh my God, you must be like the world's fastest talker. And he goes, no, as a matter of fact, this person is. And I came over and did one of my little party routines and a man walked over. He said, that's incredible. I'm the producer of that's incredible. I want to put you on the show. And at the time, I considered myself a serious actor, and I didn't think it would be uh, anything that would benefit me to go on a show where I follow a man who swallows a 30-foot python. So <laughs> I kept saying no, no, no. And then finally, the acting strike came along. Nobody was working. I had no money. And that's incredible called and offered me a nice chunk of change to go on the show. So I did. The show aired on Thanksgiving 1980. And they had three incredible talkers. They had a guy who talked backwards. He would go like, nyaf, 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 and then they'd play the tape and it would say, happy and Thanksgiving. Okay. And then there was a guy who was a simultaneous talker who says what you're saying as you say it. It's very freaky. You know, you're sitting there and he's saying exactly what you're saying. And then there was me, the fast talker. Um, was that Simon Rains? The, the, the simul talker? It, it I, might have been. I don't know. It was, you know, 42 years ago. So Yeah, because I went and watched an, an old black and white video of the, a simul just talking, and it's it's creepy. Like yeah. it's, it, it really is, because it's like he's in your head, and the, the guy I watched could, you know, do it for, uh, with two, three people at a time. And you just oh, yeah, no, it's, it's crazy. The guys that are good are really nuts. Uh, really, so really it's, uh, Yeah, that was that was mind blowing. But I mean, you're still my favorite. Don't worry. <laughs> okay, that's, uh, it's all right. You can you can like Simon. <laughs> Simon is okay. It's all right. I'm I'm not threatened by Simon. <laughs> but um, and at the time I was in a play. So what I did was I sent out a bunch of flyers saying, you know, what would you say to a man who speaks over 500 words a minute? And then you opened it up and said, that's incredible. Here for yourself. And I had the show uh, when it was going to be on. And then I had the information about the play I was in. Uh, I was in a production of The Mad Woman of Shio at a, at that time in a theater yep. in the valley. And um, I sent a bunch of proposals for commercials to different ad agencies. And one of the ad agencies I sent it to was this Ali and Gargano in New York. And they represented a time. They used to be long distance phone companies. They're not anymore, but they used to be. It was okay. called, this one was called MCI. And the proposal I had was my, my telephone calls used to sound like this. You know, Hi, my, I can't settle the telephone. Better long. My telephone bills are too expensive. I miss you. I love you. Goodbye. Now I have MCI. It's cheap. I can talk nice and slow. And, uh, That's they assigned okay. they assigned a guy to write the, to watch me on that's incredible and as it turns out he was also the writer and the creative director also watched it for federal express which was just starting out and they came up with the idea to use me for the federal express commercial which was far better oh, than my idea for MPI. i watched it four or five times when i did the research it's 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 quite funny Well, I think to this day, it's still uh, the most award-winning commercial in the history of advertising. And oh, many places yeah. picked it as the commercial of the century, uh, you know, as when we hit the millennium. So uh, it's it was very good. It it just, it catapulted me. Well, that that's incredible, aired on Thursday of Thanksgiving. And by the following Tuesday, I was booked on The Tonight Show, The Merv Griffin Show, The Tony Tennille Show, The Mike Douglas Show, started negotiating the Federal Express commercial, and started negotiating a talent contract with ABC. All in like three days. I went from like total nobody knew who I was to everybody wanted me on their show. It was amazing. Well, that ties in with one of my uh, my questions. Um, how did your, like, you know, you were trying to get work, and then you became insanely popular overnight. What was the impact, if there was any, to your, your family, you know, the, the people that knew you, that it, did they get, you know, start getting harassed by paparazzi, wanting interviews and stuff like Or was it just focused on you? Well, it went a lot from shut up to my son, the fast talker, is home. Um, <laughs> yeah, I guess I, uh, I would do that. They, um, 
no, they all love the attention. You know, they didn't get, nobody really hassled them. It wasn't like, you know, they were plagued by paparazzi or anything. Okay. Um, and, you know, they loved what people would find out. Oh, that's, you know, your brother or your son or whatever. So they, uh, they enjoyed that attention. And I know my parents loved turning on the TV and seeing me, you know, like on the Tonight Show and places like that where, you know, those are just legendary shows. Sorry? Was it with Johnny Carson at that time? Yes, it was with Johnny Carson. I've been on with Johnny Carson, Jay Leno, and um, uh, what's his name now? <laughs> Just another I'm Jay. Jimmy, you know, Kim Jimmy, uh, Jimmy Fa uh, Fallon. Oh, you've been on the, the – okay, recently. So they still yeah, I was on the Jimmy Fallon show uh, doing bits a couple of times. Well, that's – you know, it's cool that it's, you get repeating repeated work from, from, from this skill you've learned, and it's – It's I, to me it's 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 one of the the most interesting stories I've I've read because I've researched a lot of the G1 Transformer voice actor, and because that's what my channel is. And you know they they some went to the military, some went, but you had a very distinctive path. You know, like it did most of the time I see that they try to do something else and then they end up in voice acting, uh, but then yours was just so unique. So it's quite interesting. It's fascinating, really. Um, do I have other? Yeah, I have plenty of other questions. Um, okay. Uh, of all the roles in commercial you've done, uh, which one do you think gave you the longest lasting fans? Or in a sense, when you get recognized in public, uh, what are you still still being recognized for? Well, it, it you know, if this is an age thing. Older people know me from the Federal Express commercial. Um, and they'll still recognize me from that. But people uh, now who are older, you know, in their 30s and 40s, really know me from the Micro Machine Man, as the Micro Machine Man. And I have a lot of times people will come up to me and they'll go, say it. And what they want me to say is, remember, if it doesn't say Micro Machines, it's not the real thing. <laughs> and they just, they love that, you know, the Micro Machine Man introducing the most miniature, mini miniature, 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 <laughs> The Micro Machine Man introducing the most miniature, midget, miniature motorcade of Micro Machines ever, all smaller than a nut. Not this one, this one. Remember, if it doesn't say Micro Machines, it's not the real thing. Um, <laughs> awesome. That was a long, that was a long 30 years ago, but <laughs> but it's 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 still you know it's it's on YouTube and it has millions of views. Yeah, so, no, people yeah. know that. They know um, they also recognize me from uh, Saved by the Bell because I was the history teacher on the original yep. Saved by the Bell. So they'll come up to me, you know, about that, about terrible testaverdi. But it's mostly uh, micro Mach micro machine man uh, and the Transformers is the yeah. two things that people know me from. Transformers. I do have a couple of Transformers questions. Um, was there any one in particular that inspired you or encouraged you to follow this path? Because from the research I've done doing my spotlight on you, it looks like you had your sights on a goal and that you were pretty much self-driven. Um. I mean, I saw certainly people who were successful or, or I would look at their careers and say, well, I could do that. <laughs> you know, Gee, I could do that. Um, so I just was kind of driven. Um, you know, I wish I had, you know, people who were more involved in the business in my family, which I didn't. So there was no real guidance. So it was really kind of just trying to figure it out for myself. And that combined with being very, very lucky. I mean, I really... So many things just lined up in the right places. I mean, I was a contestant on a game show on the $25,000 pyramid. Yeah, I saw that. And the producer really liked me, so he gave me a job in production. The production job led me to another production job. That person led me to getting the job in Columbus, Ohio. You know, And then that those jobs led to coming out to California. So it just was... It wasn't stuff that I would have... I wouldn't have said, oh, well, working game show production is going to get me you know, on TV, but in a way that's the path that it just happened. So, um, you never know where it's going to come from. You just try to do your best, keep plugging along. And, uh, I just been lucky that it worked out. Yeah. But, but also, you know, being lucky, but also being the right guy at the right time, you know, well, you that's the skills you had. Cause I, I, that's one thing I had noticed in uh, my research is that you went from being the fast talking guy who could act to being an actor who could talk fast. Which was, uh, I was happy when that finally happened because in the beginning, people just wanted to know uh, you was just a fast talker. They didn't want me talking about acting or whatever else. So it was nice when I finally it came around and I was described as an actor, not, ju not just the, the fast talker. 
Uh, but like with anything with luck, when, when opportunity presents itself, you have to be ready for it. And uh, even for times when I really inside didn't feel ready for it, I didn't show that on the outside and I just did it. And I didn't let the fears get the best of me. Um, and that ended up working out. But for a lot of people, you, you know, the opportunity comes along, but you're just not, they're just not ready and it doesn't work out. Yeah, exactly. And it's, it's to be able to seize the opportunity. It's, uh, it's kind of what I did with you. You know, you opened the door and I'm like, I'm going to ask him for an interview. And then my friend Memo was actually, dude, you have to ask, you have to ask. And I'm like, I don't know. I don't want to, because I, I don't want to be perceived as the kind of annoying fan you know, that's going to go after people and just stalk them and everything. So, but I said, I'll take a chance and, uh, you know, I'm here now. So, you know, it's, it's well, you know what, I, I, my, uh, you, my grandmother always used to say, you don't ask, you don't get, you know, what's the worst? The person says, no, exactly. you know, if, if you were bothering me, I would block you. You know, it doesn't, you got to do what you got to do. I personally, um, I really haven't had too much trouble with, fans going off the deep end. I've had a couple over the course of the years, but mostly I really enjoy meeting and talking to the people. They're all really nice. Um, they have wonderful things to say to me, which is a great ego boost for me, you know, about how I was part of their childhood or whatever. And I'm happy that I could be that for people and give them some fond memories of their childhood. So I'm always open to, you know, talking to people and hearing from people. And if someone crosses the line, I don't have a problem telling them. But, uh, you know, you asking me for an interview was not crossing the line at all. Oh, well, thank you. I mean, it's, it's, that's, it's good to know. So because, uh, you know, I've been wanting to ask other actors. I've actually asked other actors, but I haven't gotten any type of response yet. So but eventually, you know, it, 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 it may pay off. So, well, some people don't some people don't like to do the interviews. Um, some people only want to do them if they know someone who's already done it because they don't know what they're in for. Because not everybody is a great interviewer, I can tell you that. Oh, yeah. And exactly. you're not quite and sure not what you're going to get. be a, a professional. I told you that from the start. And you're like, I'm, well, no, but I, I could see from the way that you did the, the edited piece that, you know, you took it seriously and you were going to do your homework. And so I wasn't concerned about that. Well, thank you. you. Know, plus, plus, I've done at this point, you know, literally thousands of interviews in 40 years. So... There, I'm not really worried about being thrown something I'm not going to know how to answer. So okay. I've pretty much been asked just about everything under the sun at this point. See, well, that's the thing. I was trying to, you know, come up with something original, but it's uh, it's hard because I know you guys, you know, actors go through a lot of interviews, even, you know, on screen or just to get a job and everything like that. So eventually you you kind of see, see it all, you know, so. All right, I have another one about uh, Transformers Animated. You, you're one of the few actors who reprise your role from G1 into Transformers Animated. Um, was it like slipping on an old, uh, slipping in an, an old shoe, or was it more of a different experience because the character wasn't exactly the same? Um, it was just flipping a switch. It was going in. It was different people, and I was happy to be able to do it. Now they've had Blur and other versions, but he's not a fast-talking Autobot, you know. That's right. He's the, he's just a character. Um, and, you know, in the original version and in the second version that I did, he was really the comic relief in it. So, you know, that yeah, really worked out. And it, it just was fun. We just did a bunch of stop motion stuff for Hasbro Pulse and some other things. Yeah. I've and that was those. really fun because they let me uh, improv on those. They'd say, OK, just go. And I would just do the whole big just riff on it. And it was really fun. <laughs> And Plus, I got to play a couple one. of other parts as well. So, I'm sorry. What did you say? No, it was it was a good one. I mean, I I've seen the uh, the, the the stop motion stuff, and it was interesting to see that because some of them were written by Flynn Dilly, if not all of them. Yeah. And uh, he, he, you know, we tried to clarify some stuff that you know questions that the fans have been arguing online forever. So you know, like who became Cyclonus and all that stuff. So it's fun that, the, and then yours was like he, he Blur trying to fix. Um, I think it was Cup. It was, yeah, it, it was. It fits so well. So uh, that leads me to a question from uh, my friend Memo. Um, he said, "Given your speaking talent, was Blur created for you, or did you audition for a character that existed?" No, they actually created Blur for me. 
Um, they called up and you? said, you know, do you want to do it? So I said, sure. And I went in and did it. And, you know, that was before, you know, anyone knew Transformers was going to be a thing. You know, you never know what's going to catch on, not catch on. And um, so it was great. And that original crew of guys were amazing. They were really, unfortunately, I was traveling a lot at that time. And I didn't okay. always get to be there for the sessions. I would sometimes just do my stuff separately. But the sessions were hysterical because these guys were all these fantastic voice people and actors and people. Some of them were people I grew up with. And uh, just to sit around and talk about your struts melting was just a great way to spend an afternoon. That's that, that was one of my other questions. Like you, Blur was introduced in the movie and then he played in season three. So there was already established character for season one and two. And how was the first the dynamic with the movie crew versus the show crew? Because you're one, you and maybe uh, Blaster uh and perceptor were characters that um weren't replaced you know in season three uh like orson well was replaced by uh george carmel uh, right you know, stuff like that so like was it a very different dynamic well they did everyone for the movie they recorded everybody separately so for it wasn't movie. like a, okay. yeah it wasn't like a group session um where if they could For the uh, TV version, they everyone would be in the same room and you'd read the script and, you know, act off of each other and have that kind of stuff. But for the movie, as far as I know, most of the stuff like Larson Wells was recorded separately and my stuff was recorded separately. And I didn't even know what the movie was about. And I hadn't seen the full script. I only saw my lines. And oh, they, yeah. sent, they sent Robert Stack and I out on a um, press tour and they kept telling us to tell everyone it was, you know, for kids and it was nonviolent and all this stuff and we're on all these shows saying it's nonviolent, and then we go to the premiere and it's nothing but one explosion after the next and yeah. shooting people and doing whatever and the two of us were just like oh my god we've been telling all these people it's perfect for little kids and it, you know <laughs> they should have told you there's no blood because they're robots that <laughs> yes exactly so but uh, the um no it's fun i mean the the, the movie had a huge impact because they've killed a lot of characters you know, from the, the original season. Did you ever notice any type of resentment from actors that kind of worked on season one and two? Because I know you've done panels with different actors from different seasons of the show, and you all seem to be getting along quite well. So well, no, that- everybody, I mean, first of all, the actors know that the actors have no power. That, you know, yeah. no one's getting fired because of what I say or another actor says or whatever else. Um, People are getting fired for other reasons. And as a matter of fact, one of those um, stop motion things addresses the fact that the reason why they kill off a lot of these characters is because they feel the toy line has yeah. gone as far as it can. So they want to introduce a new character so they can start a new toy line and sell more toys. So it has nothing to do with, is the actor a good performer? Is the character a good character oh, no. on the show? It has nothing to do with that. So while actors get disappointed of course when your character gets killed or written off the show you don't you're not taking it personally you know it's not you and you certainly don't blame the other actors you know you're like well i'm lucky for them their character's still around but um you know they had nothing to do with it exactly no it's not towards the talent but just that you know like when you create a character because there's actor i've noticed okay i'll do a, a quick comparison uh not with you but you know there's let's say you michael bell Who every yeah. time I, because I did my spotlight on him, and every time he talks, people ask him about it. You know, how did you feel about this? And his main answer is, it was a job. You know, he's always it's more of a job, so he's not too attached to his character. He respect you know what he did, he, and, and and he enjoys doing it. But it, to him, it's it's a job. But then you have Gary Chalk, who was uh, Optimus Primal in Beast Wars, and he's very attached to his character and the whole. There's a controversy online right now because he's not reprising his role in the movie like Peter Cullen did. Right. And, um, so he's not going to be Optimus Primal in the movie and people are asking him and you can feel that he's upset about it. With And we think it's with reason. Uh, but so, so are you attached to your characters as you know, or are you more of Michael Bell or more of a Gary Chalk? Well, characters in general, they are what they are. You play them. And that's that. Okay. Blur is a little different. He's kind of a special character. He's gotten a lot of attention. If 
someone else were to play Blur and play him as a fast-talking Autobot impersonating what I came up with, then I'd be pissed off. Yeah, because... Coming, recreating the role, coming, you know, doing a different kind of Blur um, is, you know, that's an executive decision that's made that they don't want the comic relief in this particular one. Would it be nice for them to come to me and say, can you do a more serious Blur? You know, maybe not so much of the fast talking or whatever. Yes, yeah. that would have been very nice, but people don't. That's not how people think. They actors really, um, in a lot of of the executives' minds, we're just like the scum of the earth. You know, we're just a, a necessary thing to get it done. But or they know the answers to everything else. So, you know, actors really are low man on the totem pole, and you don't ever want to get written out. You want people to associate it, you with whatever. Um, there's a couple of different websites where they just they um, compare the different who did the best blur I've I've seen, and most people like my blur, so that's good. Well, you I know? mean, the, your blur, like let's say there's a, a version of blur in Transformers Cyberverse, and you know he's fast, you know, uh, on his wheels, but that's about it, and he's not a memorable character like Blur was. Like honestly, the only reason I bought. This guy here is because there's an attachment to you, to, to the voice. To the, this is from the most recent line, and he's probably... I'm having a zooming problem, but he's probably yeah. one of the most accurate blur we've had uh, in ever, uh, even compared to the G1 toy. And, you know, the fact that, well, now this guy means a, lo a whole lot more to me today than it did yesterday, so... But that's just, you know, just me. But thank you for that insight. It's really, it's, it's really interesting because, you know, there's a lot of questions that we, we have that, we, you know, that we don't usually get the chance to ask. So uh, it's good. I just want to see, because you you cover a lot of things. Um, uh, okay. You worked on 350 of the 500 companies, the Fortune 500 companies, mostly. Um, was there an account you wish you had gotten? didn't work uh no because what i did for most of those companies and i worked for a lot of other companies besides but just out of the fortune 500 i worked for 350 of them uh and i worked for a lot of other companies most of them what i did was uh, personal appearances at conventions you know uh some kind of a bit introducing a new product uh oh, okay you know doing whatever else it wasn't necessarily commercials although i did do a lot of i mean i did hundreds of commercials uh for various different things but uh a lot of times i do training videos or a video introducing a new product to the sales team like a, for instance with betty crocker introduced the frosting that they sell the pre-made frosting they started putting real butter in it so to introduce it to the sales team i did a thing about you know now made with real butter you know kind of a really? thing okay and um, yeah, now people at home never saw that, but the salesmen saw it, you know, that well, this is a new product that we have to sell to the supermarkets. So I did a lot of that in-house stuff for those companies. Um, now, a lot of the big companies, the IBMs of the world, I did that stuff in Hawaii and in Ireland. <laughs> you know, really? They would fly you all over the world. So that was great. You know, you got a nice vacation and you got to hang out in Hawaii for a week to, you know, do a five minute bid at a convention. So that was that was always excellent. I'm in the wrong business. I'm in accounting, so yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, uh, that's really interesting. Okay, that's that's a maybe a tricky one, but how different do you think your life would have been if the people at Coney Island would have let you ride that roller coaster for two weeks? Uh, you know, that's a that's a good question because I probably would not have ever uh, talked fast. Um, you know, I mean, I talk fast because I had five sisters. I talk fast because I was Italian and I talk fast because I grew up in New York and put those three things together. It made me do it at an accelerated rate, but I would not have tried to break a Guinness record doing it. I can tell you that um, I would have just been happy being in the book as the guy, the 12 year old who rode the, the cyclone at Coney Island for two weeks straight. So it would have been totally a different traje trajectory. Now, would I have ended up an actor? I'd like to think, yes, I would have found a way to become successful one way or another. Um, I just don't think it would have been with the fast talking because I don't think that really, I only taught myself to do that because I couldn't do the roller coaster. That was it. So um, I did try holding my breath underwater and all it did was give me a headache and I didn't come anywhere close to the record. So <laughs> the only other thing, I wasn't going to eat a car or swallow lead pipe or, you know, 
put forty dollars worth of quarters in my stomach. So you know, I just um, just figured, well, this is what I can do. It doesn't cost any money. Anybody can try to do it, and uh, you know, it just but it was it something I was able to do. Master it, right? Like it took you a good a good period of well, time. You, well, when you're twelve years old. If we could all remember back then, if you get something in your head that you're going to do, you're pretty obnoxious about it. And I did it at back then. The record was set with the Hamlet soliloquy, you know, the to be or not to be. That is a question. Yep. Whether it's over the months. And I just did it over and over and over and over and over again. And I would lock bring. I had five sisters. I'd make them come in the room and I'd do it. And what did I say? You know, repeat it. Of course, I had no idea what I was saying because it was Shakespearean. But. Yeah. Um, and I just did it and did it and did it and did it and did it. And you don't realize when you're 12 years old that you're doing something 20 hours a day. You just do it until you can do it. And I finally got to the point where I was faster than what the record was in the book. So that's it's it, it's impressive. I mean, I remember as a kid, you know, trying to do stuff, but maybe giving up a little too early. You haven't given up. You gave it your all and it paid off. So. Congratulations. Well, it was something that was easy. It wasn't something where I was going to get hurt. You know, like I, I people that, you know, want to be the pogo stick champion, you know, be on a pogo stick for five hours. Right. Well, that, you know, that takes a five hours and you're probably going to fall and break your legs. Um, me, the record was only, you know, 20 seconds long or 24 seconds of that at that time with the soliloquy. So to practice, it only took me 24 seconds. It didn't take me five hours. And if right. I did it, several times it's still only a couple of minutes that it adds up to and then you take a break and you practice it again in a little while so it wasn't it was an easier record to do or to attempt well i wouldn't say easy but i mean it, it didn't cost anything it you know the the the, 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 the time requirement was manageable but the uh, it's it's still not everybody could pull that off i mean not at well not, luckily so it. and a lot of people have tried And I think that's part of the, the secret to why I was successful and why people like me is because they try to do it. And I'm not saying that if they didn't put as much work into it as I did, that they couldn't do it. But, you know, when they, they see the Federal Express commercial or the Micro Machine commercials, people would try to do it and talk really fast and do whatever. And they trip over their words. And that gave what I did more credibility. Right. That makes sense. It does. So that's, you know, it's good. Um... I'm trying to, 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 cause I, I think I'm pretty much done, but I'm going through everything I've, I've researched. Uh, you worked with the people at robot chicken. Yes. How was ripping yourself off as, as an experience? How was it? I can tell you the sentence that I did several episodes of robot chicken and played a bunch of different characters. Okay. And I can tell you the one sentence I said the most to uh, Seth Green. You cleared this with the legal department? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm thinking you cleared this with the up. legal department? <laughs> When I ripped off the Micro Machine Man, and I'm talking about my wife cutting my balls off and all this other stuff, I'm like, you cleared this with the, I can say this, you cleared this with the legal department? So they were so much fun to do those things. Really great guys. And, um, you know, just a bunch of guys sitting around having a fun time. So it was really fun. And all the voice people that they had were, were great. And um, I wish I did more of them. I only did a couple of episodes, but I played, you know, three different characters in each okay. episode. Because you can, there's a little law with the union. You have, usually have a main character, but then they can make you do two other characters as well for the same price. Yeah, I've read that throughout many of my, uh, uh, Dan Gilvezan speaks a lot about that. And yeah, I I didn't I didn't know if it was still on. Like I mean, it, I I knew the origin was because it was a radio thing where you know a lot of people could do different characters for radio commercials. But then eventually, uh, it translated to TV, and then but it's still something that you can do. It, it's still applied today. Yeah, they um you know they're supposed to. They, you can't play like two lead characters. Like if there's like a cast of five regular characters. You can't come in and be two of the lead characters and only get one paycheck. But you can be one of the lead characters and then do a couple of supporting roles. For the same Or in the case character. of Robot Chicken, since they're, it's not a serial, it's not the same characters every week, you can do three main characters, but they're not recurring characters, so it doesn't matter. Okay. But um, in, the, in a regular show, you can do 
you know, you could play a character that in this episode only says five lines okay. or four lines or whatever. All right. And I do have a, a quick uh, other question about Waldieber. Um, how was it working for you to, you know, working with a, such a um, perfectionist? I, um, you know, I think, you know, Wally never gave me a hard time because I don't think he knew what to tell me. You know, I would just say the line. And as long as you could understand what I was saying, he didn't try to really give me any direction where he would give people a lot of other direction because a, I, I think he thought that this was what they were going to get, that I couldn't do it differently if he told me to do it differently, which I could have, but he didn't. I think he just was kind of, well, yeah, I guess that's what they want. You know, he didn't really have any idea. He was very opinionated, opinionated with everybody else and really wanted things a certain way. Yeah. Um, and as I mentioned, a lot of the times it was just me doing the recording. So it was really quick. We just walk in, do it. And he was happy to get it over with. And that was it. Yeah. But I, I, I did I did enjoy that. working with him. And I really enjoyed the group sessions, you know, the few that I managed to do because they were really a lot of fun. So when you did the group sessions, you were with, Frank Welker and uh, well, maybe Roger C. Carmel and them. Dick Gaudier, uh, Dick Godier and Scatman Crothers, and I mean, just really quite a group. And you think it's a lost, a, a, not a lost art, but a, a lost technique uh, now to to have group sessions and uh, ensemble casts? Is it something that's fundamentally missing? I think a lot of shows still do um, the ensemble reading. They, you all go in there and you're all around the mics and you read the script and they get the feel for how the whole show is going to work together. It saves a lot of time on editing, you know, yeah. to do whatever if you have everyone doing it. I mean, of course, you do pickups and things and there's still editing involved. But uh, and it's also, I think, easier for the actors to have someone to play off of. You know, if it's just used there, it's like. Half the times you don't even know what's happening, you're just looking at a line you know, and then you see the show and it's like, oh, you might have wanted to mention that the planet next to me was blowing up when I was saying this song. You know, you would have yes. would have said it differently. Um, so when you're talking with the other actors in the scene and you're actually reacting to one another, you can it's like having a conversation. It's like talking to yourself or talking with a group of people. It's okay. going to be different. And was there ever. <laughs> well, yeah, no, I know with you, Robot Chicken, you mentioned, you know, that you cleared uh, you know was it clear with the legal department but what because you don't do um, ensemble as much anymore and it's mostly recorded in your own studio and stuff like that is there ever a line that you went this line out of context could be terrible and you know that you've you've questioned the line is it something the, that you have the found? only one that i really questioned a lot of the lines <laughs> was when i ripped off micro machine man on robot chicken Right. Because they, it was that was an out there script. That was out there. I mean, you know, you're talking about, you know, literally, I was about my wife chopping my balls off and all this other stuff. I mean, it just was. I'm like, I don't know. You know, it's one thing making fun of the character. It's another thing, but uh, it was fine. Nobody cared, and the micro machine people didn't care. So it just got them more publicity. So well, that's the thing, because any publicity is good publicity in, in a sense well uh, some people you know suffer from bad publicity and it, it impacts well certainly career. in the cancer culture that we live in these days you know there is such a thing as bad publicity but there never used to be yeah and but i'm just gonna theorize because i'm not i'm not a, an actor or a voice actor i'm just a, a youtuber but is there a um an impact of the cancel culture on voice acting do you guys feel it or it's mainly just live action shows and movies? Well, I don't know so much. of. The, I know people are more sensitive about who, you know, it used to be voiceover people. You didn't see them. So they could play a wide array of characters. Right. And now there is more, definitely more cultural sensitivity when it comes to canceling, uh, to, uh, to casting certain roles. Like, I don't think you would have a, a white actor necessarily playing a black character, right. which might have happened in the past. Um, it, I never personally did that. But there's all sorts of, uh, you know, appropriation that can be done when it's just the voice and nobody knows the difference who's saying what. 
Um, so I think people are a lot more sensitive about that. Yeah. Nowadays, also, every audition sheet that goes out has a paragraph about we're open to all kinds of casting, you know, submit everybody. It can be any color, any shape, any size, any age, any sexual orientation, any gender identification, any, you know, so they're trying to, you know, keep things more real where, you know, back in the past, you could, anybody, you could get away with doing a lot of stuff, you know, that yeah. you couldn't get away with now. Exactly. It's uh I, I don't know if it's, uh, you know, the whole cancel culture thing. I could go on for hours because I, I feel like, you know, there's a, maybe too much sensitivity. Um, well, I think, I think it's way overblown at this point. I think it is. Um, it's so ridiculous. I'm not saying that, you know, you don't have to be aware of people's feelings and their identities and whatever. But people need to just chill the heck out, you know? especially with comedians. This is what really gets me mad. A comedian is supposed to push the limits. It's supposed to walk the line. It's supposed to make you think yeah. and, and do that hopefully through some kind of a, a humor, wake you up and to cancel someone for making a joke, I think is just ridiculous. Yeah, you know, exactly. it's just, you're, you're missing the point of the joke. Well, a lot of people don't understand that they, they are jokes. And, you know, if you don't like a comedian, just go, don't go see him. That's yeah. Simple as that. Um, I do have, well, two last quick questions. Okay. Um, and then after that, we can uh, just keep talking, but it's up to you. Uh, the, um, I've, I've, I've come to categorize voice actors. Okay. There's working voice actors like you, Frank Welker, Peter Cullen, you know, people that, Uh, work in uh, the business. Corey Burton is probably one of uh, the, you know, he, he only does voice acting. But then you have movies where you have what I call celebrity voice actor. So, you know, they could have gotten you to do a character, but instead they, for the publicity, they went and got Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Is there, I don't want to say resentment, but it, it do you, Do the working voice actor understand, you know, that these are marketing schemes or is it just a, a point of contempt that's been going on? Uh, I don't know if I'm being clear. No, you're being very clear. And I'll give you something, a, a similar situation. Someone will do a, a part on Broadway and win the Tony Award and originate the part and be really great. And then they do a movie and they put Audrey Hepburn in it. And she can't sing, so they dub somebody else's voice in. And it's a musical. You know? Okay. Um, nowadays, the state of the business, I'm glad I was in the business when I was in the business. Because the business really sucks now. Um, okay. And it sucks for a lot of reasons. But the primary one is there's now like seven companies that run the entire business. And nothing is about creativity really anymore. Or it's a very low on the ladder, the creativity. It's all about money. And all decisions are made about money. And um, if Taylor Swift playing a part of a troll and Justin Timberlake is going to be more publicity and send in more, bring in more money, then they're going to do that. Um, instead of worrying about making a really great movie with great voice people who are going to make it even an even better movie. Yeah. And I'm not saying that Justin Timberlake and, and uh, Taylor Swift don't do good jobs. I mean, they do fine, but they, they just, they do that for the publicity. Also these days, there are a lot of actors who just aren't working the way they used to work before. So they'll do anything. Right. So you have established names that in the past would just rest on their laurels and not do stuff. And now they're doing TV shows on Paramount Plus, you know, or whatever, because they want to work. People are throwing money at them and they'll go do it. And they're taking jobs away from other people that normally would be doing the TV stuff. But now because all these people aren't doing movies anymore or whatever else, and because all these streaming things are just throwing money at people, you know, you get big big stars or one once upon a time stars doing stuff which locks out a lot of regular people yeah. so you know when you have anybody willing to do anything it's going to really you know the people at the top are going to manage to work and as you go down the ladder it's going to be less and less because there won't be stuff left 
Yeah, exactly. I think Flynn Dilly said it at one point, you know, Hollywood started being run by accountants rather well, that's than what it is. It's all about the yeah. money. Yeah. Which is sad. Maybe, I mean, you know, when they let you buy everybody, you know, it used to be back in the in the early 80s when I, d I did a lot of episodic TV. There were indep independent companies that provided shows to networks, you know, and the networks ran them. Now. The network owns the stu the studio owns the network. The network owns all the production companies, you know, so it's just the left hand is paying the right hand. And they're keeping all the money in house and only, you know, hiring people that they want to work with in that structure that'll fit into that structure. And it cuts out all these production companies and mm. people. There are very few production companies who aren't tied to some kind of studio anymore. There used to be a ton of independent production companies back in the 80s. You know, now you look at the end of any show, it says an ABC production, a CBS production, a Paramount production, or, you know, whatever. Yeah. It's all studio, studio, studio. And the studios all own networks and they're all owned by other companies and other conglomerates. And it's just bigger, 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 more money, more money, more money. Exactly. And that's that's the industry that gave us the new Michael Bay Transformers movies that not everybody liked. You know, it just it was just about money because they did a lot of money those those movies but were they great stories and great artistic piece i don't think so you know that's my just my opinion and sorry if i offended anybody in the chat who likes papers because i just saw brian here another fellow canadian and he really likes uh, the babers uh stuff but it's just you know different from what i grew up with and yeah i think yeah the business changed um a lot and uh it's not i'll give you a great example of just, um, I was a, um, I saw the, for the first time, and to my shame, for the first time in my life, I saw the movie Top Gun uh, with Tom Cruise from the 80s. I saw it maybe a year ago. And yesterday, we went and saw Top Gun Maverick uh, with my girlfriend. And the movie doesn't use green screen. It's all, you know, it's shot like an 80s style movie with them. And it was so much more intense because you knew that the stunt people, the actors were in some of these situation and it made for something much more authentic than watching a Marvel movie, which I, had, I love. Uh, and, but well, I, Marvel it's, movie it's, funny, it, it's funny you're saying this because I went to the movies uh, just a couple of days ago to see um, Dr. The doctor, new Dr. Strange movie. Yep. And they had a preview of the new Top Gun movie. And the preview was 20 minutes long and it had every action scene. So now there's like no reason to go see the movie because you saw the whole movie in the preview, but watching that and seeing all that realism and the really, the, the really the planes are flying and they're doing all that stuff was so exciting. I was, so was watching it in IMAX and then Dr. Okay. Strange came on and I loved the look of Dr. Strange, but I turned to the person I was with and I said, you know, they probably, none of these sets exist except in a computer somewhere. Exactly. Everything here is made out of nothing. They probably did this whole movie in front of a green screen. And while it looks great, it just, you know, it's not real. But, but that's the thing. It takes away from, you know, the, 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 the intensity The it's like, um, you know, the, the, the Star Trek's generation movie when William Shatner is jumping over, uh, he's in the, the dream world or the, the ribbon or, and he's jumping. And he's like, there's no tingle. This isn't real. I'm not feeling the danger. I'm not, yeah. you know. So, you want to have that that realism. So, um, so yeah, it was. It, it just, um, I, I, I kind of feel sad that the industry is not what it used to be. You know, for you guys, because I consumed a lot of what you guys did growing up and even today. And it's, it's. I, I honestly wish for every actor that they have a good experience, you know, as much fun as you guys had, you know, cause we heard a story from you guys and um, Dan Gilvezan has, I think he, he looked at this whole cast with, you know, he was younger and maybe one of the youngest of the cast. And he, he, he tells these stories as a kid would tell, you know, his parent, Oh, I've seen this, I've done this. So, and it seems like such a good fun moment to, be you know acting at that time uh, for for cartoons or even live action so but i think it's a lost you know there's something was lost you know in in 40 years which yeah is, it's sad so 
And that's the reason I, I, started I don't my disagree. Channel. Yeah, and that's the reason I started my channel is because we were watching the new War for Cybertron uh, um, cartoon on Netflix for the Transformers. And we were all excited about it because they featured, uh, it's like they took the toys or the animation model from the show back then and then they put it in 3D and the, the, the toys are extremely accurate, you know? So we were all excited. And then the pacing was slow, like the, the, the voice acting wasn't on par. Uh, everybody hated Optimus Prime, the way he was portrayed. You know, it's because it was a guy doing an impression of Peter Cullen, not take, making his, his own Optimus Prime. So that's when I decided, okay, well, that's my niche. This is where I could come in this community of fans and just show you guys the good voice acting. So it, you know, it created an opportunity for me and I took it and I'm, I'm happy with, uh, well, look at the result. You're here and yeah. I'm, I'm super excited. So it's been an hour. I know you said you don't have many hours to, <laughs> to spare, but um, sorry, guys, I won't probably have question, uh, you know, time for uh, for a chat question because I don't want to take John uh, time too much. So I will be eternally grateful for this moment and Hopefully other actors might see this and be interested in coming over for a chat. So I would love to, you know, start a trend. And um, is there just quickly any project you're working on that you'd like to share that you can share? Um, well, there's one that I've got all my extremities crossed for a new okay. cartoon. And I'm don't know where that's going just yet. And, uh, you know, I don't go on social media uh, most and uh, very much, and all my social media accounts were hacked back last summer. Yeah, you told me that, yeah. And you just, I can't get into any of them or whatever, so I had very little ways to get to the fans. But I am going to start uh, soon a YouTube channel because I took finally took like 800 videotapes that I had in my garage, and they're being digitized. So I'm going to start doing that. And then I'm also on Cameo, um, you know, doing cameos. So that's, that's fun. Okay. I like, uh, like doing that. So, and other than that, you know, as things come along, I never know, you know, the way this business is, you know, the phone rings one morning, what are you doing in three hours? And you're going to do a job and that's that. So you just never know. You never really retire. No. And that's a great thing. You yeah. know, you can slow down. I actually made, I was traveling about 250,000 miles a year for most of the eighties and half of the nineties. And I just had it. I was like, that's it enough. I'm slowing down. I'm not doing it. And things did slow down. Believe me, they really slow down. Yeah. When you start saying no to jobs, the word gets out that you're not working all the jobs anymore, but I'm very happy with the way it is now working when I work, when I want to work on shows that I want to work on, um, you know, not having the, the sort of Damocles hanging over your head. Like you got to take this job or else you're going to be out on the street is, is very nice. And so I'm really in a good place in my life now where I just, I enjoy working. And if it's something that seems good and fun, I'll do it. And if it doesn't, I won't. And that's just good. All right. Well, I'm really happy for you. I mean, you had a great career. Uh, you gave us many fun memories and stuff that we'll still talk about when, well, when I'm 60. And, uh, you know, we're still talking and playing with characters you created from back then. So. It's not going to go away until all of us are gone. And uh, but so I'm thankful for what you did. I'm extremely thankful for you taking the time for, you know, coming on my channel and uh, uh, having. This, well, you're, uh, you're very welcome. And you did a great job for your first shot at it. So <laughs> thank you. I'm having a moment. You got a, you you got a future in it. Thank you. That that means a lot. So uh, I'm going to do my last words, guys. And after that, uh, we'll do the intro. So. If you like this video, please like, subscribe, and hit the bell. Also, leave a comment. I love reading those. And remember, nothing in life gives you a right to be an asshole. Take care. Oh, I forgot to put in the music. Hold on.